Amen. It is our prayer that God would clear our minds and thoughts of anything but Him and His Word. Uh, my name's Derek. I have the privilege and joy of serving as the pastor here at First Baptist Tillman's Corner. And over the last few weeks, we've been walking through the Gospel of John. We spent some time in John chapter 1. We saw the glory of Jesus in John chapters 2 and 3. We learned that whoever believes, whoever believes in Him can have eternal life. And now we come to John chapter 4. At this moment where in the entire chapter, Jesus spins at a well. And Jesus encounters not just one person, but several people at a well. So we come to John chapter 4, anticipating that God will move. And my prayer this morning has been that God would fill you in a fresh way with the Holy Spirit. So I want to be clear from the very beginning that my goal and my prayer today is nothing short of life change, eternal life change. And so I want to ask you, just in spirit of that prayer and spirit of the songs that we've sang, to kind of shift your expectations. We're going to dive into God's Word, and we're going to learn something today in God's Word that, that if you will hear what God has to say, you will never be the same. Even if, and maybe especially if, you've been walking with the Lord for some time. Maybe your life with Jesus, your walk with God has gotten dry. Maybe you're a little bit thirsty. I don't know if you can think of a time in your life when you've been thirsty, but my mind goes immediately to football camp. Yeah, in August. There was some law in the state of Alabama that you couldn't practice football at your school for whatever reason at that time in August, but your coach could load you up in a bus, haul you several hours away, for us, it was down into the panhandle, and we would go to football camp down in the panhandle of Florida, you know, where the football field is made of sand uh, and a little bit of grass here and there. So our football coach loaded us up every year. Sometimes we went down to the panhandle. Sometimes we went up to Tennessee. But this particular year, I was a sophomore, and you know how things work, right? Seniors first, juniors second, sophomores third, and that's how things work. So I was third in line, and uh, we... We went down to the panhandle of Florida State at this little camp, and they didn't have much of a football field. We kind of made a field out of, their, out of their yard there, and so there wasn't much grass there to speak about, mostly sand. And I mean, we're out there. It's the middle of August. It is Florida. It is hot. There is sand everywhere, and we are in full pads. And I mean, we are full out football practice, conditioning, whole nine yards, and so we are thirsty. My coach, my head coach, uh, came from the old school. Some of you played football for this kind of coach. Water is bad for you. You remember that? Water is bad for you. That's how those coaches were trained. Thankfully, we had some assistant coaches who were of the new school. You need water not to die. So that was the new school, right? And so our assistant coaches would lobby for water breaks, and our head coach wasn't real happy about it. But anyway, he would, he would make accommodation for this newfangled thing called a water break. And so, um, so we got a water break. We didn't get them as often as we'd like. Uh, now, in, and when you're playing football, anytime you want water, you can get it. It was not that way back then. You had to wait. And so we had these five-gallon Gatorade water dispensers. You know what I'm talking about? It has the spin top on top of them. That's what we had for our water breaks. And so came time for our first water break. We are hot. We are tired. And I am thirsty. Seniors go first. So the first couple of seniors get up there, and they take the little paper cups, you know the ones I'm talking about, and they start pouring some water in there, and they start drinking, and they start drinking. I don't think it was 10 seconds into the water break when one of them said, hey, this isn't going to work, and they, they just twisted the caps off of those big five-gallon water buckets, and they just started taking those cups and dipping them down in there and getting a glass full of water. All the grass, all the sand, all the sweat, Every senior, drinking, drinking, pouring on top of their head, drinking. Then all the juniors, here they go, dipping in that same five-gallon bucket full of water, drinking and drinking, and then here come the sophomores. By the time it got to us, I mean, there's grass floating in the top. There's, the, the, you can't even really, the water's not clear anymore, but I was thirsty. <laughs> I didn't even check up. 
I didn't even try to move the grass out of the way. I just got a big cup of that water and just drank it. Why? Because I was thirsty. I don't know if you've ever been thirsty, but when you're thirsty, you can make some bad decisions about what you drink. If you're thirsty today, if your spirit is dry, if your heart is dead and cold, I've got good news for you. There is something called living water. And what you're looking for, even if you don't know it, is living water. Because you will never be satisfied by anything until you drink living water. John chapter 4, Jesus is going to encounter a woman. In the first few verses, I want to give you some background. Then we'll get down to verse 7 and we'll just read through the story. The Bible says, beginning in chapter 4 verse 1, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again, departed again for Galilee. Jesus had been in the southern part of Israel around the city of Jerusalem and he had been doing ministry there. John the Baptist, if you've been with us for the last few weeks, you know that John the Baptist said, hey, somebody's coming. Jesus came. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, that's the one. So uh, just last week, we were talking about how all of John's disciples left John and started following Jesus. And, G and John said, that's what's supposed to happen. He must decrease. He must increase and I must decrease. His numbers are going to grow, mine are going to shrink. So Jesus' numbers are growing. And it brings, to the, uh, it brings Jesus to the attention of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are, are Jesus, if you know the story well. They, they're kind of his enemy all throughout his ministry. Now, Jesus is not afraid of the Pharisees. Jesus is not afraid to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Pharisees. He often does so, and he always wins. Even when the Pharisees move and work to actually have him crucified, Jesus wins. He's raised from the dead. But it's not the time. Jesus has other work to do and the Pharisees will only get in his way and they'll continually try to stop everything he does and Jesus has work to do in Galilee. So he's going to leave southern Judea, Jerusalem, and he's going to head north. So he's down around the coast of Alabama and he's going to head up north to the mountains of Alabama. He's going to get away from this area, and he's going to move north. But between Jesus and Galilee, there's a place called Samaria. We read about it in verse 4. He had to pass through Samaria. So you're leaving South Alabama. You're headed to North Alabama. You might say, well, i got to go through Montgomery. It's just the way you got to go. Except in this case, there are a couple of other ways to go. There are three main roads that go from Jerusalem to Galilee. Only one of them goes through Samaria. Most Jewish people did not take the one that goes through Samaria. Why? Some 700 years earlier, the Assyrian Empire had invaded the Northern Empire. And the Northern Empire, the area that, that is called Samaria in this passage, it was already more wicked than the Southern Empire. It was... a empire that had lost its way when it comes to following Jesus. And so Jesus, what happened was they, they said, you know, we need to establish other places to worship. We, we need to get us some, some places to worship other than Jerusalem. We can't have everybody going down to Jerusalem to worship God. Only thing is God had said, this is where you're to worship my people, uh, where you're to, my people are to worship me. And so the northern kingdom said, let's set up some other places to worship God. So the Jewish people who were faithful to God's law didn't like that. But even more so, when the Assyrians invaded, they, they took the people who were there in northern Israel and they scattered them all across the Assyrian kingdom. And then they brought in other people, other people with other religions, other people with other philosophies and ideas, and they began to intermarry with the people in the northern kingdom. And those are the Samaritan people. The Samaritan people, by a miracle of God, really held on to the core of their Jewish faith. They still were pursuing a relationship with the one true God, but things had changed. They, if you will, they compromised their religion. They kind of mixed some things in with some of these 
other religions and so for a Jewish person, oh, you'd, better, you'd rather be a pagan than a Samaritan. Samaritan had compromised. Certainly, God no longer loved the Samaritans. That's the way Jewish people might have thought of it. So they wouldn't go through Samaria. They, they wouldn't want to set foot in that area. But the Bible says here, Jesus needed to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. This is not so much a statement of geography as it is of theology. Jesus had a point to make. We'll see the point become really clear all throughout chapter 4. Jesus is on a journey, and he needs to go through Samaria because he needs to meet someone there. Jesus knows very well what we're going to read in the verses that follow. So Jesus needs to go through Samaria. He's got a point to make. He's got a person to meet. He wants to prove that actually the Messiah is not just for the Jewish people. The, the, the Messiah is even for the Samaritan people. So he needs to go through Samaria. So he does th so. He came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Do you know Jacob's well is still there? You know, I like to do things in the yard. I like to build things. I like to do things with my hands. Some of you like to do that. Some of you like to plant things. Do you think anything that you build today will be there 2,000 years from now? And No, of course not. It'll be gone. My house is not going to be there 2,000 years from now. 2,000 years before this moment, Jacob, whose name also is Israel, dug a well. And he dug a well that is still there. So this is 2,000-year mark when Jesus goes there. It's now 4,000 years. It's one of the best attested archaeological sites in all of the promised land that this is all but certain uh, Jacob's well. I mean, you can go there today and see the work of a man done 4,000 years ago, a hole he dug 4,000 years ago. It's still producing water. It's really something of a miracle. So J Jesus finds this well on his travel, and then this is really important. Don't miss this statement. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. It's about 12 o'clock. Probably Jesus and his disciples started traveling early in the morning to avoid the hottest part of the day. So they've probably been walking maybe for four or five, maybe even six hours. So why was Jesus tired? He'd been walking for six hours. Most of us would be tired if we'd been walking for six hours. Here's why that's so important. Jesus does not pretend to be a human. Jesus is not God wearing a human suit. Jesus is fully God, but he is also fully man. Jesus gets tired when he walks for six hours. I bet you get tired when you walk for six hours. Some of you just came back from surrender last week. You were on tour with our surrender choir, and you are tired. <laughs> Why? You were on tour with a bunch of teenagers last week, and they wore you out. You're tired. Jesus got tired. It's very important that we recognize the full humanity of Jesus. Jesus knows what it's like to be tired. We'll find out in just a few verses. Jesus knows what it's like to be thirsty. So he's weary from his journey. He's sitting beside the well. It's about the sixth hour. We'll pick up in verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans? Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or come here to draw water. 
You will never be satisfied until you drink living water. Why? Very quickly, I want to move through six reasons in this passage. The first is this. Living water is alive. It's called living water for a reason. It's different than the water you're going to get out of the well. It's different than the nasty water that I dug out of that water cooler that day. It's different than the water even that's purified out of, uh, out of some purification system. This water is alive. It does something. It is not just something physical. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, he would, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So right away, the woman should recognize Jesus is not talking about the same kind of water that I'm talking about. I think she does. I think she's a little sarcastic. It's hard to read sarcasm into a written document, but I believe there's some sarcasm going on here. I believe she says to him, where are you going to get this living water from? You don't even have anything to get the regular water out of. But Jesus is talking about something very different. See, once you have living water and once you get living water, you're satisfied because it is that. It is living water. It does something for you that regular water cannot do because it's alive. Second reason, it's spiritual. Living water is spiritual. So we're not talking about normal water. That should be very clear. She says, you don't have anything to draw water with. The well is deep. Where are you going to get this water from? I want to take you to John chapter 7, and you don't have to look it up. You can if you'd like to, but just listen. John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. Jesus makes it crystal clear what he's talking about when he talks about living water. He says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out. So in John 4, he's speaking to one person. In John 7, he calls it out to everyone. If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then John explains to us what Jesus is talking about. Now, he said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Living water is spiritual. Living water is alive. Ladies and gentlemen, living water is the Holy Spirit of God. The third person of the Trinity. The, li the, the living water is that the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you and you walk with God and God walks with you and God dwells inside of you. You can't get that out of a well. You can't dig a hole in the ground and find it at the bottom of it. But you can have it. And you'll never be satisfied until you do. And then I want to speak to Christians for just a moment because here's what happens in our Christian life. We get it. Oh, and we have it. And we know it's true. But then we come to a passage like this and we read it. And we say, you know, that's not where I am right now. Did you lose it? And Jesus said, once you have it, you'll never thirst again. You didn't lose it. You just forgot you have it. You've settled for some other things, which leads me to my next point. Why will you never be satisfied until you drink living water? Because living water is greater than anything else you have tried. It's one of my favorite moments in the Bible when the Samaritan woman looks at Jesus and asks a really dumb question. You know that old phrase, well, there are no dumb questions. This is one. <laughs> are you greater than our father Jacob? Oh, you, you must think you're somebody. You're going to give me some living water? Do you know where we are, right? We're in this well that was dug by our father Jacob. Are you greater than our father Jacob? You remember who she's talking to, right? She's talking to the one who came down from heaven and wrestled with Jacob all night. And when he wanted to be done with the wrestling match, he took one finger and touched him. Is he greater than our father Jacob? Yeah, you better believe he is. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. He is the one that every knee will bow to and every tongue will confess to. He is the one that Jacob is in heaven right now on his face worshiping. Oh, yeah. He's greater than our father, Jacob. Are you greater than our father, Jacob? See, 
This woman came to this well probably every day. She got water out of it. She needed that water. And she thought about Jacob a lot. Thankful that Jacob dug this well. Thankful that it's a good well that God had blessed, that had provided for God's people for, at this point, 2,000 years, provided water. And she had had that water, and it was good. But she had never had living water. And because she had never had living water, she couldn't imagine that anything else could be better. When, you, um, when you've been working outside, it's really hot, what do you like to drink? Now, don't answer out loud. That wasn't a joke about alcohol, but I think some of y'all took it that way. But anyway, what is it? Oh, well, hold on. I said don't answer out loud. I'm going to give you a chance to answer out loud in just a moment. For some of you, it's a glass of Coke. Man, a good, cold Coke. And if you're like me, then you can tell the difference in a Coke that's been poured out of a plastic bottle versus a glass bottle, one that's come out of a can, one that's come out of... You can say, oh, this Coke, that's from McDonald's. This Coke, that's from Burger King. You can tell. I mean, you know. You know. <laughs> For those of you, you know, no, 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 I, I actually drink the healthy stuff. I drink Gatorade. And some of you say, are y'all even from the South? It's sweet tea. Man, when I've been working on a hot day, I want a glass of sweet tea. Here's what we know about all those drinks. They're good when we're hot. They're good when we've been working outside and we've been sweating. But they're lying to us, aren't they? They're not really helping us. There's so much sugar in those drinks, even Gatorade, that what our body is craving is not rehydration. Our body is actually craving the sugar that's in those drinks. And that's why they taste so good. But even as we drink them, we know this is not what my body needs. Now, here's the part where you can answer. What is it that your body needs? Water. water. You need water. And you know it, but... If you're not careful, you develop a taste for something else. You develop a taste for sugar. And when you're really hot and when you've been working outside and you've been sweating a lot and you really need water, what your body wants to drink is sugar. And sugar is not going to help you. Sugar is a cheap substitute for what your body needs, which is water. And listen to me, followers of Christ. Those of you who have tasted the living water, you've walked with the Lord and your fellowship has been sweet and your time with God has been good and you have known the power of the Holy Spirit, it is easy in your life to start to settle for a cheap substitute. And anything will do and you know it's not good for you. And when you're angry and when your day is long and when you're tired and when you're in a tough spot and when things aren't going the way that you want them to go, you don't turn to the living water, you turn to a cheap substitute. And before long, you start to develop a taste for the cheap substitute. And you know you shouldn't turn to it, but you turn to it anyway. And you, what you know what you need is the Holy Spirit, but you've lost your taste for fellowship with God. And because of that, when you read these verses that, that the living water will become inside of you like a well flowing up to eternal life. You go, I know it should be that way, but pastor, it's just not that way for me. I want you to know you can have it back. It's been given to you. It is yours. Jesus has given it to you and you can have it. But you got to remember that living water is better. It is superior to anything else you have tried and Number four, living water meets your deepest needs. Jesus said, you drink this water, you'll be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And dear Christian, if you're thirsty, somewhere, somewhere you've stepped away from the living water. If your spirit is dry, If your spirit is thirsty, you've stepped away. But you can come back. You know, when you drink those bad substitutes, it takes a little while, doesn't it? You can retrain your body. You can retrain your body so that what your body wants, and you've been outside and you've been working and it's hot and you're sweaty, 
what you want is a glass of cold water. But it takes some time. You got to get away from the other stuff. You got to let your system reset. And then there will be nothing better to you than a glass of water. In the same way, that's why repentance is so important. That's why when you got sin in your life and you know it's sin and you know that it's not good for you and you know it's a cheap substitute for the real thing but you turn to it because it gives you that temporary relief but then immediately the guilt and the shame pile on and you've turned to whatever it is. It may be just as simple as gossip. It may be, you know, we have a, we have a, um, um, a, a drug now that allows us to gossip, that allows us to kind of get infuriated, that allows us all the things that come along with, with gossip. It's called social media. And we can turn to it easily. And we can say, hey, I need to get a little bit of a fix. I need to see what's going on in other people's lives. I need to see what other people are saying. If there's the news feed. We can be continually infuriated and outraged with what's going on. It kind of gives us a little bit of a fix, but we know it's not really what we need. Oh, then there's pornography. I know that standing up here every Sunday as I preach, I preach to men who are caught in this trap. I know it. I know that in the time that we live with the devices that we walk around with, I know every week that I'm preaching to men who are caught in this trap and you're ashamed of it. It has robbed you. And you know, you know it's destroying you. But you turn to it in a moment. And you know it's a poor substitute. And you know it's not what you need. And the guilt and the shame pile up afterward. But you've developed a taste for it. Increasingly, I'm speaking to women who are addicted to pornography. You know, 20, 30 years ago, you used to say, well, men are addicted to, phys to, to physical or visual pornography. Women are addicted to written pornography. Just as bad. But that gap is closing so fast. It's almost equal now. The number of women who are looking at sexualized images of other people. Oh, Pastor, I don't, I don't go to those websites. I stay away from those websites. Hey, the day is gone when you have to go to a store to buy something to see pornography. And the day is gone when you have to go to a website somewhere out of the way to see pornography. Pornography, men, is coming to you. It's coming to you in your social media feeds. It's coming to you in your news feeds. It's coming to you on sites that have nothing to do with it. It is coming to you, and sometimes it's called soft porn because the woman still has some clothing on. There's no such thing as soft porn. There's only porn. And if it's an image intended uh, that is sexualized, intended to make you think sexual thoughts about another person, then for you, it is pornography. So if it's coming up on your news feed or your social media feed or the television shows that you watch or that you stream... Do you know, they track these kind of things. Do you know when the show Game of Thrones was on? Searches for internet pornography went way down. You don't have to look at it on the internet. You can now just watch it on Game of Thrones. So it's there on all of your streaming apps. It's there on your social media apps. And then it's there on those websites that are dedicated specifically to pornography but it's a cheap substitute and it's stealing your soul. And if you say, man, I don't, I'm not walking with the Lord. I don't feel the presence of God anymore. You have settled for a cheap substitute. And notice, when, when does it hit you? When you're tired, when you're lonely, when you're angry, when you've had a hard day, when you had something difficult at work. It says to you, I can get you through this, but it lies. It lies. It'll get you through the moment. But how could we ever think something like pornography or social media or even time on a device, or time with a hobby, hunting, fishing, how could we ever think that any of that is a substitute for fellowship with the Holy Spirit of God? It's not. So if you're follower of Christ and you say, hey, <laughs> I'm thirsty, then you've bought something that you think will meet your deepest needs, but you really know it won't. 
And Jesus says, you drink this water, you'll be thirsty again. But not the water I give him. You drink that water, you'll never thirst again. Number five, living water is a gift of God. How, how do I get it, Pastor? It can only be given to you. If you knew the gift of God, Jesus says, and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would ask him, and he'd give you living water. See, this woman in Samaria, she's not there to draw water. She's there to meet Jesus. But she didn't arrange the meeting, did she? Jesus did. I need to go through Samaria. I know that woman's going to be there at that place that day. I need to meet her. And he goes through and he sits down at the well. He knows she's coming and he has a gift for her. Eventually she'll take it. Eventually she'll say yes to it. We've got some time to go. We've got some other passages to cover. But eventually she'll say yes and she will take this water. But Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God, God has a gift he wants to give to you. The thing about a gift is, You can't get it any other way unless someone determines to give it to you. Good news, God has determined to give it to you. You know, one of the last verses in all of Scripture talks about living water. Revelation chapter 22, the Bible says in verse 17, the Spirit and the bride, that's the Holy Spirit and the church, say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who desires come. Take the water of life without price. That means that gift has been offered to you today if you will have it. It's yours to have. Whether you're in this room, you're watching online, it's yours if you want it, if you'll have it. You've got to lay down all those cheap substitutes. You've got to put those things to the side. But it's yours if you want it. God has offered it to you. He has offered it to anyone who will come because it's a gift of God. Finally, Living water is available to anyone through Jesus. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Remember, it was about the sixth hour. What a loaded statement. Do you remember who we had in John 3? Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus? He's the teacher of Israel. He's high. He's esteemed. He's Jewish. He knows the law. He comes and sits right in front of the Messiah. And Jesus says to him, Unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus seems to be offended by that and walks away from that meeting without the Messiah. Now later, praise God, he will come to be part of the kingdom. But in that moment, he misses it. Then we turn the page to John chapter 4, and we have exactly the opposite. What's the woman's name? We don't know. She's not named like Nicodemus. She's a woman. Women were thought of at that time and still in many parts of the world as having no theological ability at all. I've witnessed to a lady in a remote village in part of West Africa and only to have her say, this sounds interesting, but I can't make a decision like that because I don't have a husband. Her husband had died. She said, once I have a husband, maybe I can do something like this, but I can't make this kind of decision. That's the way women are thought, were thought of in that time. Women were thought of as, they can't really engage in serious relationship with God. No, that comes through their husband or their father. Well, we know the truth. A woman, an outcast of society, not just any woman, but this particular woman, not named to us, a woman who was considered a second or in some case even third class citizen, and Jesus comes to her. And she's a woman who comes to draw water at the sixth hour. Years ago, on another trip to West Africa, I was out in the early morning. The sun had just come up, and I was out for a jog. And I was out in the most remote village I've ever been in. And in that village, there weren't wells all over everybody's courtyard like I'd seen in other villages. There was only one well in a courtyard. That was the chief's courtyard. Everybody else had to come to the well that was in the center of the village, and that's where they got their water from. And I'm out for an early morning jog, and I kind of turn the corner, and I'll never forget the scene that I saw. There, very early in the morning, just after the sun had risen, the coolest part of the day, there was a line of women waiting at that well to draw water. I immediately thought of this passage. You know what the women were saying? I don't know their language well enough to know what the women were saying, but I don't have to know their language. It was check-in time. 
That's what was going on in that line. This is one of the few times of the day, this is a very difficult life that the women in that part of the world lives. one of the very few times of the day that they have to, to sit and talk and check in on each other. And I don't know who had done what to who, but I know it was getting, it was getting passed around right there at the, at the well that day. I mean, it was check-in time, and I mean, it was just, there was so much commotion going on, and you could tell it was just the place to be. It was the social moment of the day. And when I saw that, and I saw those women lined up with their containers waiting for their turn, to get the water to, tear, to carry back to their family. And it was the early part of the day while it was cool and while it was the easy time of the day to draw water because it is hard work. When I saw that, I thought, oh man. If you're not in that group, you wouldn't dare walk up to that group of women. And if you did, I could just picture it. It would get deathly quiet. There she comes. The one we've just been talking about. We get real quiet and we get real awkward. So probably this woman's coming in the middle of the day. She's been married five times. She's had five husbands. So probably she's there to avoid that kind of scene. She's an outcast among a group of people who are outcasts. She's a woman. When the disciples come back, they're surprised to see Jesus speaking with a woman. But this living water is available to her. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. <laughs> it doesn't really matter what other people think of you. It doesn't matter about your past. It doesn't matter whether you get to sit at the cool kids' lunch table or whether when you walk up to that table, everything gets really quiet. Did you know you can have living water? Did you know it's yours? It can be yours. It's offered to you. Do you know God is no respecter of persons? What he offers to me is what he offers to you. Do you know God created you in his image to dwell with you through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to walk with you, to spend time with you, and God loves you and desires that relationship with you, and it doesn't matter who you are, and it doesn't matter what you've done, and it doesn't matter what your past is, and it doesn't matter what you did last night, last week, last month, last year. God wants to walk with you, and he has living water from you for you. And see, it's a gift. It's not something you earn. It's a given to you if you'll have it. You heard it. You heard one of the last phrases in scripture. Let anyone who thirsts come and drink of the water of life without price. You can walk with God. You can know God. You can have the Holy Spirit of God live in you and walk with you. It's yours. You can have it. And if you've walked away from it, if you only knew, if you only knew, who it is that is speaking. If you only knew who it is that speaks to you from this word, not me. If you only knew whose word this was. Oh, but dear Christian, you do know, don't you? You know because you've walked with him. You know because you've experienced this. But you've lost it. Do you want it back? Hey, you know, this can happen to an individual. It can happen to a church, too. I pray. It's one of my prayers I've, I've prayed throughout my ministry. Lord, never let us be okay going through the motions. I don't ever want to be satis satisfied with that. I don't ever want to say, well, hey, budget's good. Seats are full. Man, good to have a great full choir today. That was great. Man, our giving's good. Man, our strategies are working well. Kids are doing real well in Awana. I never want to be satisfied with those things. Because you know what they are? They're good things, but they're cheap substitutes for walking with the Lord. I want to be a pastor and a church that experiences the presence of God through the power of His Holy Spirit. But you know, that means we've got to reject all those cheap substitutes. We've got to say we don't want those things. If our church grows, if it doesn't grow, it doesn't matter. If our choir is full or it's not full, it doesn't matter. If we or one of the top giving churches, or we're not. It doesn't matter. 
Those are all cheap substitutes. But if we walk with the Lord, and the presence of the Holy Spirit is here with us, oh man, then we are fellowshipping with God. We are drinking living water. And we will be satisfied. Are you thirsty? If you don't know the Lord, why don't you come to the only one who can give you living water? And if you do know the Lord, how badly do you want back what you have lost? Because I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to humble yourself. Sometimes it means letting people know that they that you aren't who they thought you were. That you aren't where they thought you were with God. So you're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to let go of those substitutes that you've trained your spirit to enjoy. And you're going to have to come in desperate pursuit of God. Are you thirsty? Father, would you move in our hearts? God, would you give us a desire for you and nothing else? And Lord, would you then satisfy that desire? Lord, I pray for those across this room, those who are watching online. God, would you give us a desire for you? And then Lord, fulfill that desire in the way that only you can. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus.